Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of council and staff. I will call this meeting to order. Today we acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on the traditional territory of the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. We are thankful to share in the special spirit of this place, rich in the energy of Mother Earth, our ancestors, and the love of all creation. Tonight, before I ask for the motion to adopt the agenda, I thought uh, that I would just uh, give a brief uh, presentation with respect to today being almost to the day, our first anniversary of, of this council. Our first meeting last year was on December 17, and today is December 16. And over the last two weeks, I've been meeting with individual members of council and talking about uh, getting their thoughts on what we've accomplished in the 12 months, the last 12 months, and what they see as priorities moving forward. And I think it would be helpful for me to share that with uh, our residents and, uh, and to give my thoughts on behalf of council um, about what I've heard uh, about the year we've had, the year ahead, and the remainder of our term, the next three years. So looking back, we've had a very busy uh, first year on many fronts. We've completed some very large legacy projects, including the closing and the sale of the town's remaining 50% interest in our local utility college shares to EPCOR for, for just over $15 million, almost twice the $8 million that we received for our initial 50% back in 2012. That's a considerable appreciation uh, when you consider that it's a short six-year time span. We also closed the sale of the Collingwood Airport to Winterland Developments for what, $4.1 million, passing a very important uh, municipal and regional asset um, that's underserviced and was not something that was within our municipal bailiwick. And we passed those into the hands of a very aggressive private sector owner who is prepared to make that airport thrive and become the economic driver that it can and should be. And while doing that, we've removed a $200,000 annual liability from our books. The total of the, pre uh, the proceeds from these two transactions is approximately $18.5 million. These are one-time legacy funds, and it will become uh, a big responsibility of this council, together with our community, to look at the use of those proceeds as we move forward. I think I speak for council when I say that it's our hope that these funds will be invested in critical legacy projects that will make calling with the progressive, leading-edge 21st century municipality that we all know it can be. This council has also inherited the Judicial Inquiry, a very significant and important investment for our, in our municipal governance structure. As former Madam Justice Bellamy, the Commissioner of the Toronto Inquiry, said in her testimony here on November 27, government officials have a duty of trust to the public. They are trustees for the public, and every minute of the job, every decision they make, they are required to put the public interest ahead of their own. The Collingwood Inquiry is looking into the processes that were implemented in this town hall in 2012 that resulted in the 50% sale of our interest in Collis and the purchase of the new Sprung buildings for recreational uses. And while this is a large budget item, when you consider that the town's annual budget is approximately $90 million, in six years over $500,000, half a billion dollars will go through town hall. And I think and I think it, I share this on behalf of Council, that the investment of $5 million or 1% of that amount in making sure that our local uh, processes in Town Hall have the proper checks and balances in place to make sure that we can account for every single dollar of taxpayer money is money that is well spent, it is a wise and prudent investment, and it is also one that was very necessary given the circumstances in which we found ourselves in the last term. During the last year, Council undertook some significant corporate restructuring with a strong emphasis on customer service and community engagement to better serve our residents. We created the Executive Director position, welcome Sonia Skinner, to carry out the restructuring and champion the customer services initiatives as well as new initiatives such as our environmental initiatives. We created an accounting accountability officer, and welcome Sarah Forche, to lead our transparency and accountability initiatives such as the lobbyist registry. We have had some personnel changes, saying goodbye to some long-standing important senior staff like Nancy Farrar, Director of Planning, and recently Brian McDonald, Director of Public Works. And I want to thank both Nancy and Brian and many others who retired over the course of the year for their many years of hard work and expertise that have left an indelible mark on in our community. That said, I also want to welcome some of our new hires, 
Adam Ferguson, communications manager, who has taken a portfolio and morphed it into an award-winning one, and our communications are continuing to grow and evolve. I'd also like to welcome uh, Adam Farr, our new director of planning, and Peggy Slama, our most recent hire, who has now moved up to director of public works. This council looks forward to working with each and every one of our hardworking staff to fulfill Collingwood's promise. Council has done all of this while being financially responsible, living within our means, and keeping the wheels of our municipality turning smoothly. We continue to pay down debt and pass the responsible budget in 2019 that saw an increase, I think, in the rate of about 1.12%. Looking forward, 2020 promises to be a very busy year as well, starting tonight as we work towards finalizing the 2020 budget. CAO Amin's thorough strategic work plan for 2020 will keep us focused on important priority issues as we work to increase the efficiencies of our operations in Town Hall and throughout the corporation, work on the customer service transformation, work on developing the sustainability agenda to create an affordable, inclusive, safe and environmentally responsible community with a strong and diverse economic engine. And we will do all of this while operating in a fiscally responsible way and working to continue to reduce our municipal debt load. No one has said that this would be an easy task. And as we heard from, uh, in response to Councillor Hamlin's question the other day to our compensation review, the roles of council are many and varied, as are those of staff. But we work together with our community. And as I look forward to the uh, challenges ahead, I cannot think of a community that is more prepared to work with their council to make this a progressive leading edge municipality. One final thought, as I have said many times, that municipal government is about dialogue between the residents and your council. This is the cornerstone of effective, transparent and accountable government. It's an iterative process, which occasionally yields the results you want, and occasionally it does not. It is the nature of the process, and I hope we, and when I say we, I mean council, staff and the residents of this great community, will continue to work together cooperatively and collaboratively for the better of our community. That is what our community deserves, and that is what we have collectively agreed to expect of ourselves. So to this council, to our staff, and to the public, happy first year anniversary. I look forward to continuing to work together to make Collingwood the leading edge, progressive, vibrant, and sustainable community that we all envision and we all deserve. And with that said, I will look for the adoption of the agenda. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. It's uh, moved by me and seconded by Councillor Doherty. Be it resolved that the content of the Council agenda and addendum for December 16th, 2019 be adopted as presented. Thank you, Council. I'll call the vote. All in favour? That is passed unanimously. Declarations of pecuniary interest. Oh, sorry. Are you declaring? Okay, I'm sorry. Declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. It's a carryover from last week. Uh, item 11.1.7, specifically 8.2, it's the request for ICE from uh, CCI, the local high school. Both my boys would stand benefited. Thank you. Any other declarations? Seeing none, who has the adoption of minutes? Uh, that it would be me. Uh, and moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Madigan. Be it resolved that Council approve the minutes of the regular meeting of Council held November the 25th, 2019, as presented. Council, any errors or omissions before I call a vote? Seeing none, all in favour? That is carried unanimously. Any uh, business arising from the minutes? Seeing none. Community announcements. I'll turn to you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. I'd like to, uh, I guess, maybe just say uh, three things. One, is just uh, appreciate your comments to start the meeting and uh, echo your sentiments. And it's, a, it's been a pleasure to uh, work with this table for the past year and look forward to the next three. Uh, number two would be that um, for those who, uh, who are aware, um, out of the cold, uh, which is a, a nonprofit. Uh, volunteer-run organization here within our community. They have now been open uh, two weeks today. And uh, over the two-week period, they have had uh, 44 uh, individual intakes. Um, so it's good news and bad news. And uh, the bad news, of course, is that uh, we require a service in our community. 
the good news is that we have a, a volunteer base and we have a significant outreach from the community and uh, broad support from uh, various sectors, various uh, uh, industries, uh, social groups, uh, uh, our uh, churches, etc., who have really come together, rallied to support the Out of the Coal program to ensure that our most vulnerable uh, have a place to stay every night uh, out of the cold. So thank you to all those who have made the program a success uh, two weeks to date. And uh, lastly, this is our last meeting for uh, the year. I know we're here tomorrow night for uh, our standing committee, but uh, I'd like to just wish everyone uh, a very Merry Christmas, the best of the holidays, uh, and a Happy New Year. And uh, with any luck, tomorrow will be our last meeting and we will not meet until the 5th, which is, I guess, our um, uh, mayor's uh, party. So with that, best of the season to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and we'll see how we go. Uh, just the one, um, and it comes with a little bit of a speech as well. We seem to be speechifying. Uh, there are a couple of ways that you can know that uh, for sure that Christmas season is upon us. Uh, the Santa Claus parade, people putting up their trees and uh, their lights, and then of course the Christmas movies, the undisputed king of which is Die Hard. And so I'm happy to report that Hans Gruber fell from the Nakatomi Tower on Saturday night, so Christmas season is really, really here. The other thing that you can now tell that Christmas is really here is if there is a staged reading of A Christmas Carol, the Charles Dickens classic. And just by chance, I happen to know of one, which is Friday night at First Press Church. Yours truly will be Mrs. Cratchit, among other ladies in the uh, script. Two mayors will be taking part as well, one of whom is at this table. And I think you'll really enjoy it. There are tickets available at uh, Theatre Collingwood or at Theatre Collingwood's website. Thank you very much, Mayor Saunderson. Uh, two things, just uh, to echo what Deputy Mayor said about uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and uh, to our dear friends and mine to the left, Happy Hanukkah, my friend. Starts a little bit late this year on the 22nd. Uh, and uh, this Saturday is my son's 21st birthday. I, uh, so I have to give my kids a shout out every time. I can't believe he's made it till, well, he hasn't made it yet, but he'll make it till this Saturday. Um, and that is it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Maddie. Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I have no announcements, uh, but I will also take this opportunity to wish all members of Council uh, all the blessings of the season and uh, to our residents the same. And may we all enjoy a happy and prosperous 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Berman. Nothing for me, thanks. Nothing about Hanukkah. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Um, no announcements this evening either. I'll be using my time under other business for a brief report. So I'm the Joint Police Services Board meeting and the uh, FCM Advocacy Days. But I too would like to uh, wish everyone in our community a very happy holiday and Merry Christmas. And uh, I know we've already spoken of some great causes today, but there are so many out there less fortunate than ourselves. And I hope that everyone will take an opportunity to help out as and where they can. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you. I have no community announcements, but echo the uh, greetings of the season so well expressed by my friends around the table. Thank you. Uh, I have no community announcements, and I think I'll say my well wishes for the end of the meeting. We get this behind us. We have a full agenda, so with that said, I am going to get us into uh, item seven deputations. And tonight we have a very special presentation. Uh, the Collingwood Urban Sustainable Development Goal Pioneer Pilot Project on Urban Economy and Municipalities. Uh, this is a UN Habitat uh, project, and we have with us tonight Reza Orbaziri, the co-chair of Urban Economy Forum and first UN Habitat Global Advocate. Reza, I'll call you forward, please. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much. Great collaboration with City of Collingwood uh, through 2020. Uh, I try to uh, present a summarize of the program. Uh, it's about global urban SDG pioneer uh, that is led by UN Habitat Urban Agency of the United Nations. Uh, as you know, sustainable development goals is the the 
main agenda of the United Nations. Uh, this agenda laid by UN Habitat, Urban Agency of the United Nations. That is, uh, it's good to know, Habitat born in Canada, 1976. And uh, we have a great collaboration in different period with uh, Government of Canada. We had uh, the World Urban Forum, 2005 in Vancouver, and we have a great collaboration uh, between the City of Toronto and uh, Government of Canada uh, before. Uh, we uh, established Urban Economy Forum as a great initiative because we believe uh, if you want uh, to uh, lead uh, and realize sustainable development goals, you need to have uh, access to urban economy, correct, sustainable urban economy, and municipal finance. And based on that, this is the main uh, challenging point, or one of the main challenging points for the municipality, urban economy and resources. Uh, without resources, the, the, all the program is a kind of dream. And uh, uh, we try to organize Urban Economy Forum uh, to create a kind of specific literature for the uh, towns and municipalities. We establish a kind of uh, guideline in collaboration with Oxford University. Uh, the name of the guideline is uh, Finance for City Leaders because we have a serious gap between uh, municipality and city leadership and bank and financial institution. All the municipality needs to have to access to the uh, financial resources. And, uh, but uh, this kind of action between uh, municipalities and uh, financial institution. And based on that, based on the, the role of UN Habitat uh, as a goals, uh, as a leader of goals number 11, uh, we uh, have a resolution to create a kind of pioneer uh, town in the level of town because we believe uh, if you want to have a specific pilot project you need to know about the scale of the, the community in, in, the, in the metropolis you cannot realize a progressive <laughs> idea but uh, in the level of town you have a correct uh, interaction with the society and you can have some uh, some program you can realize the program based on that we have uh, we create a, a global pilot a pioneer project and uh, during the urban economy first uh, conference in urban economy forum uh, we have a kind of agreement with letter of intent with uh, city of Collingwood uh, based on that, we are trying to organize a uh, specific program in the category of research and also a kind of leadership program uh, under the uh, uh, Department of Research and Capacity Building of UN Habitat, Urban Economy and Municipal Finance, and Youth and Livelihood. This three departments in charge of this program. Also, we have a collaboration uh, with World Bank, with UNESCO and UNICEF about that. Based on the structure of the collaboration, uh, we, uh, ha we are trying to finalize the action plan for uh, our first pioneer project. The, uh, this action plan try to uh, involve Canadian town, a kind of collaboration. We had a a meeting with Minister of Finance, Bill Monroe, and uh, we got great support from federal government uh, about our pioneer project. We hope to uh, nominate 10 specific uh, projects in Collingwood based on priority. We got uh, all the action plan, strategic plan, uh, different uh, uh, kind of research about Collingwood. We are reviewing on that and then that I, I, I believe this is a great opportunity to uh, introduce Collingwood as a city wants to realize sustainable development goals. And uh, it's a great opportunity for Canada to lead the 
role of sustainability in the world. This is the, uh, we got a great message from the Prime Minister uh, for, world, uh, for urban economy forum, and we got a kind of um, support from uh, um, Canadian um, CMHC uh, and Ministry of Finance. Based on that, uh, we try to finalize and present the action plan uh, during this week and uh, we are trying to organize first meeting in Ottawa in, in the Office of Minister of Finance uh, about presenting uh, structure of the program and we hope to, uh, based on a brief negotiation with uh, Ms. Jeffrey, uh, to have uh, some representative from towns from other 13 province uh, in the round table to create a kind of Canadian uh, town voice about sustainable development goals. And uh, the, the, the main goals is uh, providing a kind of international conference in Collingwood uh, during the 2020, um, exactly before General Assembly, uh, United Nations New York in New York. Uh, the name is Habitat in Town, and in that conference we uh, try to create Collingwood International Resolution about sustainable development goals, how we can realize sustainable development goals in the level of uh, town, and uh, what is the challenging, what is the opportunity, and uh, this is a kind of, uh, a kind of official negotiation between the local authorities and we want to uh, present to the Secretary General based on we already passed five years from 15 years of uh, our target for 2030 and we have 10 years. Based on that 10 years, w we believe we can have a kind of annual conference under support of the United Nations here in Collingwood as a a round table, international round table or summit of Collingwood for all the city leaders in the, in the level of town uh, kind of global summit to uh, review, uh, reassess, uh, providing a kind of urban assessment uh, for, uh, for town and we hope to step by step find a solution to realize uh, sustainable development goals that is hold the program. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Mr. Proziri. Councillor, are there any questions? Councillor Hamlin. I just wanted to say thank you for coming and unfolding you know, this program for us. It is so exciting. Really, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I really appreciate from Mayor and Ms., Mr. Farid Amin to provide this opportunity for us. And I believe this role is matched with Canada, Canada Mandate and could be introduced uh, Collingwood as, a, as, a, as a, a kind of town close to the sustainable development goals in the world. Thank you so much. I don't, um, Deputy Mayor, I don't, uh, through you, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you have two colleagues with you that have traveled uh, to Collingwood. I'm just curious as to if you'd like to introduce them and, and what's their role within your team? Yeah, we have, uh, we have a kind of steering committee based on Urban Economy Forum, many of uh, UN Habitat colleagues and uh, some people from uh, United Nations General Assembly in that, um, in that steering committee. And uh, we will have, uh, we are trying to expand our steering committee to the local. We have two or three people from the uh, city of Collingwood and uh, so two ministers from in the, in the federal uh, government of Canada, some people, Lieutenant government, very support us in this uh, initiative and uh, we hope to launch the, the pioneer cities in the office of Lieutenant government. And uh, uh, we have some specific person from a uh, president of the University of Toronto is in, in the part, uh, it, what is a kind of high level uh, international board of the, our urban economy forum and uh, we have four secretariat uh, in, uh, in, um, under urban economy forum. Um, there is some project, for example, we established World Urban Pavilion 
in collaboration with Daniel Corporation uh, in the Regent Park. Uh, we will have a meeting with Deputy Mayor Anna tomorrow with uh, President of Daniel. And um, Kabran is uh, one of the board for Urban Economy Forum, one of the nine person. Uh, and Evan uh, is the head of secretary for sustainable development. We have four secretariat working in uh, four area. Urban Academic, uh, the, the secretariat chaired by, by Jose Echeverri, uh, one of the governor of York University. And uh, Alex is head of a uh, governmental organization and another person. We have four secretariat and co-chair, Urban Economy Forum, co-chair between me and Marco Camilla, head of Urban Economy and Municipal Finance of United Nations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and this is a very exciting opportunity, and we're looking forward to working with you uh, to move this forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And this is a very exciting agenda, but don't feel that you have to stay. <laughs> All right, the consent agenda, item 8. Who would have that? Councillor Matting. I do, Mayor Somerson, moved by me, seconded by Councillor Berman, be it resolved that the general consent agenda, having been given due consideration by Council, be received, and that is 8.1. Thank you, and just before I call the vote, there's a one item on here, and there is a request. Uh, it's uh, 8.1. Uh, Reed Thompson Tennis School, 255 Osher Bluff Road, and Town Development Charges at Bylaw number 2019-54. That request being on the, the agenda, the only way it can be dealt with is if somebody pulls it. So first I will be asking for the vote on receiving the agenda, and then if anyone would like to pull the item to have it addressed, I will ask for that afterwards. So for receiving the uh, consent agenda, all in favor? That is carried unanimously. Is there anyone that wishes to pull an item? Councillor Jeffrey? Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I think just because I would like a bit of background, because I don't know what I don't know whether I want to pull it or not. So I think I have to pull it to find out. <laughs> okay, and I will. This was a deputation that was received at the uh, oh, or Corporate and Community Services. Which was it at? Corporate and Community? Okay, I was not there, so I would look for. Um, I guess to you, Councillor Madigan, to give some background. And then if we need some help from the Treasurer, we can go there. Wonderful. Not that I don't like the sound of my own voice, but if I could just go straight to the Treasurer, that would be fantastic. It was it was tough at the committee level um, because there was not uh, any staff uh, direction to go. So uh, Mr. Fimbo came and, and uh, gave us a lovely presentation. And I thank him very much for his time. And then he left. So, okay. I'll uh, go to Treasurer Leonard then. My understanding is it was a request for a waiving or a, to restart the timeline uh, for asking um, a waiver of development charges uh, as a result of a fire that burned the buildings down on this property. Uh, uh, Treasurer, if you can maybe give us some background on the events and then the status of the request. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, you are correct. This building burned down in June of uh, 2015. And uh, we have contacted both our uh, development charge consultant and our chief building official. And uh, both of them have uh, agreed that uh, regardless of the fact that uh, they didn't get a demolition permit, the correct procedures were not followed. And uh, without, uh, actually without getting a demolition permit, the, the, uh, the area has uh, sort of been maintained in uh, a, a situation that's contrary to the Building Code Act. They both, uh, both the CBO and um, the consultant agreed that the clock would have begun in or around June 4th, 2015, with the five-year limit actually coming due in June, uh, roughly at the, the 4th of 2020. There were uh, two of the floors, or approximately, um, I can't recall off the top of my head, uh, were uh, non-residential, so for sure they would have uh, been in at the commercial rate for development charges. And um, it appears that uh, one floor had some residential, um, but again, it also contained a boarding school for those people. So we're talking somewhere between the 
fifteen and uh, thirty thousand uh, dollar deferral rate on that. Um, in order for me to really fully determine that, I'd, I'd need to get a little bit more information on it. But again, we just uh, completed a development charge study, and we were told we had been discounting the non-residential rate since two thousand and nine. At that point in time, Council voted to bring the non-residential rates to where they should be by September the 1st of 2024 through the phase-in, which I've just done the first calculation now and getting ready to uh, post that. And uh, just to remind uh, Council, for every type of deferral or extension granted, the lost DC revenue falls on the taxpayers to uh, provide the funding for that. And as I stated at the committee meeting, I, I would not recommend that this extension be granted. Councilor Jeffrey, does that assist? That was great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Doherty, you had your hand up, and I see Councilor Hammond's hand. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And um, I had put up my hand because I did want to pull it for discussion. Um, but um, my, my, my key question is, um, notwithstanding the explanation that the treasurer has just provided, um, it, it seems that the uh, proponent is of the view that his application is consistent with our bylaw. And when I read the um, background information that he has provided, um, it does. Uh, it, it certainly seems as though he was in compliance with our bylaw. So I'm just I'm a bit confused because of the discrepancy. What? Um, the proponent believes and what our staff believe. And I'm wondering if there is an opportunity here for us to have a look at clarifying this bylaw. I think there's two questions in there. I think the first question is uh, just looking at the scenario when the building burns down and if no building or demolition permit is required, that what triggers the timeline to run in that case? And I would look, I guess, to the treasurer or to the, the chief, or chief, if he has anything to add on any of this. <laughs> He's putting up his hand, it's on your hands, Marjorie. Mayor Saunderson, if, if I could just add, so I asked the deputy chief a question that evening, so that might help the chief in his answer. So through the committee, we asked uh, if a demolition permit has not been if this was common occurrence in our community for a demolition uh, uh, permit not to be registered and his uh, response paraphrasing is there was nothing left to have a demolition permit for so it was uh, common knowledge that the, the property was burnt to the ground so but that that i did ask that that evening i forgot to mention that before i apologize well let's go over to the clerk or to the treasurer unless the chief wants to add something on would you like to add something uh, through you worship we uh, at the time of the fire we uh, ended up uh, bringing in an excavator to, to dig the property out. We had to break the back wall out. At the time, there was believed to be uh, people missing in the fire. So we dug the whole property out with nothing left other than the foundation at that time. So just to make it clear, and then we recouped our costs for that through my fire code allows us to recoup costs for, for uh, a turd by the municipality for uh, a turd deemed for investigation. Thank you. So then, uh, Treasurer, maybe you can give us some information then on where that leaves us in terms of is a, what triggers the timeline to run then in the case when a building permit or a demolition permit does not seem to be required. I, uh, through you, Worship, or to you, your Worship, I believe that uh, in agreement with the chief building official, the, pro the process was not, the current process was not followed. Regardless of whether or not they needed a demolition permit, they should have received a demolition permit. We're talking about a project that has uh, been, or a property that has been there for four and a half years. The time is running out, and he, or Mr. Finbo, did indicate that it would be two to three years before their redevelopment proposal would be coming back towards Council. During that time period, we will be phasing in our development charges to get them to approach where they should be for commercial properties. And if anything happens within this, if you grant the five-year extension, then it will be the taxpayer that uh, will be on the hook for any of the lost development charges in that time period for redevelopment. Thank you, Marjorie. Councillor Doherty? 
Um, so just to reiterate, uh, thank you through you to um, the fire chief and the treasurer. So uh, what you're saying is that no demolition permit was required. And so the issue then falls back on uh, the date of the, the actual event as opposed to the date of the uh, issuance of the demolition permit, correct? Is that, is that as I understand it? Again, through your worship, that is the interpretation that we've received from our consultants and from the chief building official. Thank you. Pastor Allen, you had your hand up. I did. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I read this with some interest. Um, and I did hear, of course, our treasurer say uh, that they should have obtained a, dem a demolition permit. Uh, and I'll just start with that because to me that seems to be a different issue than the one uh, that Mr. Finbo has brought to council on behalf of his client. Um, and if they should have obtained a demo permit, I presume there are mechanisms available uh, to our staff to make sure that happens. But the, the issue here, as I saw it, was that they were asking for a credit. Um, and when I looked at the bylaw, I think our bylaw lacks a few words. Because our bylaw addresses um, demolition, but only where the structure has been demolished in order to facilitate redevelopment. And I looked a bit, um, I did a little bit of research, and I could see other municipalities had words such as, and I'm going to be leading to a motion here in a minute, I uh, had words such as what happens uh, in respect of credits when there's uh, been uh, demolition, when there's been um, structures damaged by fire or unforeseen circumstances or has been unlawfully demolished or removed. So in the case of that, then different rules might kick in. Um, and specific timing might kick in as opposed to um, ours, which just says a demolition permit, uh, where a demolition permit's been applied for to facilitate redevelopment. Because that's not the case here. We have a fire um, that demolished the building. So in reading this, I know I'm a little technical here. <laughs> I would say our bylaw doesn't cover the situation at hand. Other bylaws do. And what I wanted to suggest, um, and here was, this is a motion that, uh, lucky. Yeah, sir, I'm lucky. I'm just, I'm just going to interject. Okay. Right now we're dealing with the request, um, and as I understand your comments, you're saying that our bylaw doesn't really cover the scenario in which they're requesting the waiver of the fees. Yes. So yeah. let's, I, I think we have this, the opportunity, and I, I know your motion's there, and we have an opportunity to enter the next uh, standing committee to talk about that. Okay, under 11.1.1 and so right now I'm just focused on whether or not there's anyone in the early council table that wants to move this request for an exemption under the current bylaw as it stands. So seeing none, uh, then we will move on. Uh, and that takes us then to uh, the corporate uh, item 11, Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee. Nope, did I miss one? Sorry, we're at item nine. Item nine. Nine usually follows eight. Uh, we'll keep going here. So it's reports and minutes of other committees. And 9.1, the council received the Collingwood Public Library Board minutes of November 21st, 2019. Who would have that? I would have that, Mayor Saunders. Uh, uh, Councilor Berman bailing out here from the <laughs> Moved by me, seconded by Councilor Madigan. Be it resolved that council received the Collingwood Public Library Board minutes of November 21st, 2019. Very much, Council. Any comments or questions before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, this carried unanimously. Right. So now we come to item 10 Strategic Initiative Standing Committee Meeting, December, uh, November 28, 2019. 10.1 Standing Committee Report. Who would have that? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunders. And it's uh, moved by me and seconded by Councillor Jeffrey. Jeffrey. My apologies. Uh, be it resolved that Council received the Strategic Initiative Standing Committee Report from its meeting held November 28, 2019, and hereby approve the recommendations contained within the report as presented. And there were five items. 10.1.1, deputation, divestiture of Collis Assets by Tim Fryer. 
10.12 presentation, RE Parks and Recreation and Culture by Deep Dive. Sorry, it was a deep dive by our own staff. Uh, 10.1.3 was CC 2019-03, Community-Based Strategic Plan Refresh, Proposed Refresh for Public Input, again by our staff. 10.1.4, T2019-16, Asset Sales Survey Results, again by our staff. And 10.1.5, a delegation from Don Rollmet on behalf of the Collingwood Arts uh, Centre Action Group, our request to support the project with seed money participate in a feasibility study and work collaboratively with related town departments. Thank you. So under our new protocol, if there's any items somebody wants to pull rather than just uh, to speak to, uh, we need to pull them now before I call the vote. Seeing none, all in favour? That is carried unanimously. And now we get to item 11, Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee meeting of December 2nd, 2019. Mr. Madigan. Thank you very much, sir. I move by AB, second by Councillor Berman, be it resolved that Council receive the Corporate and Community Services Standing Committee report from its meeting held December 2nd, 2019, and hereby approve the recommendation contained within the report as presented. 11.1.1, deputation, request for development charge demolition credit, re 255, also Bluff Road, Mr. David Finbo. 11.1.2, calling the downtown BIA Board of Management Minutes, November 14th, 2019. 11.1.3, T2019-04, Bill 68, Municipal Act Amendments to Tax Sale Procedure, Bylaws Prepared. 11.1.4, PRC 2019-20, Community Recreation Culture Grant Program and Events Provision Framework. 11.1.5, T2019-18-2020 Interim Property Tax Levy Bylaws Prepared. 11.1.6 T2019-19-2020 Temporary Borrowing Bylaw Bylaws Prepared. 11.1.7 General Consent Agenda, which is 8.1 Town of Embersburg Resolution regarding Declaration of Climate Emergency in the Town of Embersburg and 8.2 T. Hammond, Collingwood Collegiate Hockey Course and start to request for funding regarding Hockey Day in Collingwood, January 15th, 2020. Thank you. Um, before we call the vote, I'll ask for items that want to be pulled and I will pull 11.1.7 uh, to allow the Deputy Mayor, or 11.1.7, sorry, 8.2 to uh, allow the Deputy Mayor to leave. Uh, actually, Deputy Mayor, if you just stay, we'll pull that item out and separate it. We'll deal we'll on the other ones first. Are there any other items that uh, people would like to pull? Councillor Hamlin. Uh, yes, this would be 11.1.1, 11.1.3, and 11.1.0. Okay. So now we're going to be voting on receiving items 11.1.2, 11.1.5, and 11.1.6, and we'll leave 11.1.7 separately. So we're voting really on three items now. So I will call the vote on those three items. All in favor of receiving those? That is carried unanimously. So then to start with 11.1.1, uh, Councillor Hamlin. Yes, um, as I was uh, mentioning previously, <clears throat> it struck me when I reviewed this item that our bylaw could stand a refresh to specifically address the circumstances where a building's been destroyed by fire or other causes. Uh, and that um, I, I was uh, then thinking we could apply these new provisions that would come into force because they would be brought forward and we could discuss them and approve them to Mr. Finbo's client's position. Um, because, I, as I said, I don't think our bylaw addresses his situation at all. Um, so, uh, what I've brought forward uh, as prepared by our deputy clerk, and if, is this appropriate for me to suggest a motion at this time? Okay, sure, you can read in this motion, um, and then we'll put it on the floor for discussion. Thank you. Um, We'll get the motion okay. okay. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor McLeod. Be it resolved that Council directs staff to investigate potential amendments to the development charges bylaw with respect to credits being applied to the redevelopment of structures caused by fire or unforeseen circumstances or has been lawfully demolished or removed. Okay. Uh, if you can 
pass that up for Councilor. Yeah. And then I will open the floor. <clears throat> you want to speak first, Councilor Hamlin, or? Uh, yeah, I guess my biggest thought on this, other than what I've said, is that, you know, clearly this is a matter that could use some attention of uh, legal counsel. Because I certainly put on my legal hat when I reviewed it, and no one wants to be my legal opinion, I'm sure, around the table. So, um, so that's why I've suggested uh, that this be put to staff to come back to us with some considerations around changing our bylaw. I'm going to speak in support of this motion because I believe that there is a room for um, mercy uh, around this table. And at the very same meeting where we discussed, uh, where we received the report from Mr. Finbo, we also had a conversation uh, about um, tax sales. And uh, the treasurer was quite clear that at no point does she want to take someone's home. And I think that I applaud that sentiment, and I agree with it. And I think that these, um, the owners of this of this um, building, did not choose uh, uh, the fire <laughs> to happen. And I think that there um, that perhaps there may have been some misunderstandings along the way that I don't quite understand at this point. But I think that I would like to err on the side of mercy if we can. These people didn't tear this house down or tear this building down in order to redevelop it and to turn it into something else. It was destroyed by an accident or a fire. And, and so that's where I would stand on that as a municipality. I think if we can show mercy to uh, people who are involved in financial troubles regarding their taxes and other people, we can perhaps find some room for some mercy in this case as well, or at least have the staff find a way to figure it out. Okay, I, 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 before we go on, I'm just because there's, there's always a thorny issue in the legal world, and that's the retroactive application of changes to bylaws to existing circumstances. And I guess what I'd like to do is put this question through to the treasurer, and you may or may not be able to answer this, Marjorie, because it, it is a legal technicality or a technical issue. That if we were to change the bylaw regime now, how does that affect the situations that already exist? In other words, do we retrospectively apply changes under our bylaw? If, if uh, I understand the need, the concern about looking at moving forward, but I'm just in the context of how that affects the bylaw. Through you, Your Worship, I don't have, uh, I'm not a lawyer, and I can't give you a legal opinion on it. I can say that consistently opening and changing the bylaw does provide the business community, the development community, with a lot of uncertainty that is going on. Again, as I stated, this type of thing is um, um, a cost to the taxpayer, not necessarily to the person who, in this case, received insurance money for the fire. Um, and again, in the long run, there are some other situations out there that this may in fact be opening a, a, a whole new can of worms. They may not have had a, a demolition, they may have had a demolition permit that's going to run out as well, but they could come basically and perhaps ask you to extend their um, time period for the redevelopment credit. So we can definitely get legal advice on it, but my personal advice is to not reopen the development charge by a lot unless it's absolutely necessary. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dory. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, uh, just uh, speaking to uh, Councillor Hamlin's and McLeod's comments, I, I do believe that, uh, and, and also my own questions, it is evident that there is some um, room for interpretation, uh, potential holes in the bylaw, and I would um, suggest that if we can tighten it up and account for a situation like this, or any other that perhaps is not accounted for properly in this bylaw, that we should do so. Uh, whether or not it should be applied retroactively uh, is another question entirely, um, and uh, I am not a lawyer. I cannot uh, judge whether we should or whether we shouldn't, but uh, certainly we, we need to have some objective standards against which we make decisions like this. 
uh, if we can improve the bylaw, but we still have to apply it objectively, I believe. Uh, <coughs> yes, I think there's two issues on the table. One is um, clarification of the bylaw, if there's a perceived uh, gap, uh, and whether or not it applies to an existing circumstance, I think is another issue entirely. Councilor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunders. And I guess first, <coughs> yes, in terms of you know, I'm constantly questioning when the taxpayer is actually going to feel the benefits of some of the hardships and the decisions they've been making. And I think this kind of decision and putting yet another aspect on the backs of the taxpayers isn't probably the direction we want to be going in. That's my original thought with this. Um, if our intent were simply to ask staff to review the bylaw to ensure it said what we think it should say uh, in terms of implementing um, what we want to have done. Maybe there is no change required. Maybe it does already say exactly what we need it to say. So I would be willing to support that, but not directly to say staff to change it. I will read the, uh, the resolution or the motion on the table. The council directs staff to investigate potential amendments to the development charges bylaw respect to credits being applied to the redevelopments of structures caused by fire or unforeseen circumstances or has been lawfully demolished or removed. So that's the wording of the bylaw that we're looking at. So it's really asking the staff to investigate potential amendments and report back to council. Uh, there's no timeline on that and my understanding is uh, regardless of the retroactivity uh, component, the timeline for the request is uh, April, was it, of 2020? Through you, Your Worship, I can't uh, answer that question at the moment. I have uh, year-end uh, coming up, and uh, with uh, the workload that we've had in 2019, we're significantly behind in those uh, reconciliations. Okay. So, are there any further questions or comments before I call the vote? Councillor Madigan. No. Thank you. Um, so through you to the, the treasurer, thank you so much for bringing clarity that uh, this unfortunate, uh, unfortunately wasn't an accident, it was uh, arson. Um, they were they were, they were, were paid out through insurance, so they, they've had five years to do this, but this Hamlin's, Councillor Hamlin's uh, motion is not to retroactively do anything, just to more or less look at our bylaw, just to see if we can kind of shore it up a little bit. Is that the, the understanding around the table. If I were to invite, vote in the affirmative, it would be voting for that and not voting for um, the Thompson Tennis School. Yeah, so I think this motion it has nothing to do with the Thompson Tennis School. It's asking staff to investigate potential amendments to the development charges bylaw with respect to credits being applied to the redevelopment of structures caused by fire or unforeseen circumstances or has been lawfully demolished or removed. So it's asking for an investigation of potential amendments to our existing. Excellent. Thank you very much for the clarity. Deputy Mayor. Um, can I, I'd like to speak to the motion. I'm not going to speak to the Thompson School, but I just wanted to ask one point of clarification through you to the Treasurer. I asked the question last week, and I just want to clarify again. If something was retroactively applied, it would, and a property was then transferred, the, the retroactive change would be transferred in ownership as well with the deed. Is that correct? Uh, to you, Your Worship, yes. Okay. Um, so I, I'm of the opinion that, that I, I'd be comfortable voting in favor of the motion if the CAO was given the latitude to look at what staff have got already on their plate and bring it back in an appropriate manner, looking at whatever resources need to be done to, to bring forward some recommendations one way or the other um, in that respect. Uh, with regards to the comment of uh, Mercy, I would um, very respectfully, and I realize that it's the spirit of the season, but I disagree in the sense that there has been some time that's lapsed. Mr. Fembo made it very clear when I asked the question that insurance had been paid out. And based on this, and the fact that we all know that property values within our community have increased significantly, uh, if a decision was made retroactive, we then would have no recourse of coiling back that money should this person in turn transfer the title of deed through a property sale, which uh, given the size of the property and location, I would comfortably
would suggest, um, stands to uh, stands to be sold at a fairly uh, significant amount of money. So I, I read and I, I did speak to it. I'm sorry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So I think for clarification then, a uh, motion on the table is looking for staff to investigate potential amendments to the existing development charges bylaw with respect to credits being applied to the redevelopment of structures either caused by fire or in foreseen circumstances or lawfully demolished or removed. That's not being done in reference to any particular property um, and I think that uh, that report would obviously come back to council and uh, if there's discussions about the applicability of how changes if any changes are made, how they would be applied, I guess we would get legal advice on that at the time. So the motion right now as it stands is just asking for staff to investigate and uh, I would look to the CAO uh, or I guess I would look to Councillor Hamlin first, sorry, if there's any, uh, are you asking this within a specific timeline or are you comfortable with the comments of the Deputy Mayor that this be at the discretion of the CAO given the busy time of year and the workload on staff? Yes, that's fine. Okay. So I think unless I think that's clear now, and unless there's any other questions, I'm going to call the vote. So all in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And the next item I think was 11.1.3. That was also uh, is it my turn to talk now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, do you have a motion? No, no, I, I do. Okay, so I let's, do. Okay. let's get the motion on the floor and then you can speak to it. <clears throat> okay, moved by me, seconded by Councillor Berman, be resolved that staff report T2019 04 be received and the council enact a bylaw delegating authority to the treasurer to authorize the execution of tax arrears extension agreements. Thank you. Questions or comments? Councillor Hamlin. Okay, thank you. Um, I have questions of our treasurer uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as I understand it, this will come up when someone's, I just have a few, I'll say leading questions, so I want to make sure I understand what's going to happen here. Um, I understand this would be where someone's in arrears on their property taxes. Uh, and a tax certificate's been registered, so there's some arrears there. And without an agreement, is it then what happens if we don't have one of these extension agreements, the property can proceed to sale to cover, to cover the taxes? Through, through you, Your Worship, that is, that is correct. The old Municipal Act allowed it three years before you went to tax sale, and during the process of tax sale, it provided the individuals with an extra year so you basically had four years with the change to the municipal act it's now two years the process still takes one year so when you get to that point in time we try to work with you during the period of uh, time but when we hit the tax sale it's auction or extension um, and would this apply to residential and commercial properties and, and industrial as well Again, through your worship, yep. we have to treat all taxpayers, regardless of whether it's commercial or industrial or residential, in the same manner. We have to treat them fairly. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, through you, Mr. Mayor, is there a policy uh, that's been set, and I don't know this, maybe there's no person I'm asking, is there a policy that's set that gives some parameters around um, how these extension agreements will be formatted in terms of length of time, interest rates, um, and so on? It's covered under, through you, Your Worship, that the delegated authority is covered under the Municipal Act. The goal is to get the taxpayers' uh, arrears up to date as quickly as possible, but at a level that they can afford. And that would be the treasurer's uh, the treasurer's uh, call on that, through you, Mr. Mayor. Treasurer, sure, sure. my understanding is that there's very explicit uh, requirements under the municipal act that govern a tax sale. It's quite prescribed. Um, but Marjorie, maybe you can help on this. That's through, right. you, through you, Your Worship, the tax sale itself is most definitely uh, very prescribed. The town um, actually opts for auctioning off of the property. In terms of the question that Councillor Hamlin has asked. 
There is no uh, time frame involved in it. When we look at it, we look at it in terms of allowing the taxpayer, because we, we have no knowledge of why they're in the situation that they're in. It could be um, marital breakdown, it could be a serious illness, it could be a loss of job. And what these extension agreements try to do is to provide the person with the opportunity of getting out of the hole they're in and by taking it into the uh, delegated authority of the treasurer, it's also to allow that person to have some anonymity and, and retain their dignity within the community. Um, Mr. Mayor, I think I'll just address my, my concerns here. Um, what I'm talking about is not the tax sale, but to avoid a tax sale, um, the municipality has the option of entering into an agreement with the taxpayer who's in default and under that agreement, the taxpayer will have an extended time to repay. And I certainly uh, appreciate, um, you know, there could be circumstances of illness and so on, and I'm not opposed to extension agreements because we can all think of circumstances that it should be dealt with. My concern uh, is more that it's in the hands of one staff person, and whether it's the treasurer or you know, the clerk, <laughs> or some person who's still to be appointed, you know, it shouldn't be one person who's doing this. And I'm concerned and um, about the transparency around this, um, around the accountability around this. Um, I worry having, you know, experience with uh, corporate entities over the years, you know, we don't want to find ourselves in positions where large corporate taxpayers get behind and then have a, a, a lever that they can use, um, you know, in terms of jobs and every other manner of thing that could be lost if they don't get their extension on their taxes. And I think that these kind of discussions, if they're going to be had, um, should be had at this table, um, or at a minimum, there should be a reporting back on a regular basis, perhaps annually, from the staff person who has responsibility for entering into these agreements because these agreements have the potential of giving someone a significant financial advantage. Instead, you know, historically, and as our treasurers pointed out, there was no concept of having extension agreements. You, your taxes were due, you pay your taxes. <laughs> so now they've tightened up the timelines, and I think because of that, they're giving people more time uh, by, through these extension agreements. The section itself in the Municipal Act doesn't say, oh, you can uh, delegate this to a particular person on staff. It says the town. And I know there is general authority in the Municipal Act that allows us to delegate you know, any number of things we wish to. But I just feel since this ha is something that can confer a financial benefit on an individual, um, it shouldn't be something that's in one person's hands. Um, it should come, um, as I say, to this, this group for accountability purposes. So I am would be voting against this. this. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments before I call the vote? Seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? Two and one. Thank you. Eleven point one point four. Yes, thank you. Uh, moved by me, seconded by Councillor Berman. Uh, be it resolved that staff report PRC 2019 20 be received and the council approve the recommended revisions to the community recreation and culture grant program and the council approved the revised approach to special event permitting as recommended within the context of the events provision framework. Right, council, any Councillor Hamlin, you wanted this pulled, so why don't you lead off for us? Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple of things here. Um, my concern is it does not, uh, from the few people I've spoken to today and yesterday in the arts community, although I, th I think the consensus is they were happy we would have some rules around these grants, the general concern was that they wish they could be consulted before this is finalized. Um, there are, uh, are a lot of changes that are proposed here. Um, that could be tweaked to make it a little more friendly to our arts community. Um, I have uh, spoken to um, 
people at the uh, the arts in the uh, theater community and to people in, at the uh, Blue Mountain Foundation for the Arts. And some of the, the uh, matters that they drew to my attention uh, was uh, a limit. And I think that uh, Erica Angus actually sent uh, all of council uh, an email today summarizing some of these things. Um, but the, the fact that the um, grants would only be handed out in um, to one application per year, uh, they felt was too limiting and that, that community groups should be encouraged to bring forward applications for grants uh, for as many opportunities as were possible within the confines of the funds that were available, of course. Um, there was concerns about the in-kind support that was mentioned would be relating to tables and chairs within the venues that were allowed. Um, and it was suggested to me that uh, perhaps the facility should be, be beyond tables and chairs and maybe accounted for such things as equipment, storage space, other furniture, and so on. And there was some worry that the uh, in-kind wouldn't apply beyond the facility. So in other words, if there was an event on Simcoe Street, as there was last summer, uh, how would that be dealt with? Um, there was concerns uh, about how the economic impact would be measured, because that was one of the criteria if tourism was to be the goal of the particular uh, grant request. Uh, it was suggested to me that perhaps those should go through our economic development group. Uh, and not through the Arts Department, and they wanted to have an opportunity to discuss uh, how the economic impact would be measured. Um, there was a suggestion as a particular way that it could be measured and that perhaps staff could be measuring it instead of these groups that have an ever-declining number of volunteers. Um, and there was concern also, if I can say, that the BIA would have a veto power over you know, the programming that would take place in the downtown area. Um, lastly, there was some concern, if I can find it, I can't. Um, just generally how this was going to impact the arts community, and they really wanted to sit down and have a review of this before it came forward for vote. So my uh, motion would be to ask that this matter be deferred and brought back to council uh, following um, this consultation. Before I look for a seconder for the deferral, I'm going to look to Director Culver and if you would like to respond to some of those uh, questions about the, uh, the treatment of the arts and culture community, maybe give some, I don't know if you have statistics on past numbers and how you think this would impact given the uh, changes that are proposed and the rationale of staff in uh, preparing this report. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, there's a lot of questions uh, involved in this, and so I'm going to do my best, but hopefully uh, <coughs> Council Ham will catch me if I miss uh, one of the concerns. Um, and also, I've asked um, our Manager of Culture Events, Karen Cubitt, to be here to help as well. Uh, so we'll get through this. Um, I would like to start by saying that uh, in 2019, of the 25 grants that were issued through the uh, Community Appropriation and Culture Grant, uh, Twelve of them uh, were to arts organizations, so a little less than half. Uh, three or three grants went to sports organizations, uh, and ten grants went to others, which would include uh, places like breaking down barriers, and, uh, look for uh, barrier removal, or um, uh, other kinds of sort of social connection uh, type of programs. Um, the um, uh, the answer to the question uh, regarding um, So the consultation piece. So the consultation piece is a bit of a difficult one. This has uh, traditionally been a competitive program. Um, we have limited funds, and last year alone, I believe there was over $106,000 in requests uh, attempting to take a piece of $50,000 in actual funding. So I'm not exactly sure how we go about doing a consultation when um, that's fair and balanced and transparent um, and meets the need. We we based criteria for the grant on what we understand the culture or the uh, parks recreation and culture mandate to be and so we've mapped it to things such as were discussed in the, the operational review 
uh, to facilitate and fulfill the programs that were identified. Um, certainly, we have to acknowledge that PRC does not cover every single uh, need to its maximum effect as would be desired by individual with every individual in the community. We do our best, uh, but going after a consultation in this regard is going to be problematic, and I'm not 100% sure how to design that. Um, I think um, I, 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 uh, I, I'm not sure. I, there's a lot of questions, so I think I'm probably just going to, if, if there's something that Councilor Hamlin would like me to answer, or any member of council, uh, I'll do it on a one by one basis because there's a big bulk of, of answers to supply. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I didn't anticipate Director Calder would answer all those questions. Uh, these are questions, these are just some of the questions that have been put to me uh, in terms of discussions they would like to have um, around these grants. Um, and, and as I say, it's not just you know, how much it's, should they be restricted to um, certain streets in the downtown where things will take place, should the BIA have um, a veto over things. You know, there's just some discussions. I, I would say that, that they would like to have had. That's all. all right. So, if there's further questions before I call this for a second on the deferral, Councillor Doherty, did you have your hand up? Uh, sorry, I forgot that you would be looking for a second on that. Um, I would, I would second that. Okay, you second the deferral then. So that's a request for the deferral, and there is uh, no question or comment on the deferral. So I will call the vote then. All in favor. All in favor of the deferral? Opposed? So the deferral has been defeated and we have a motion on the table for the uh, grant policy uh, framework. It's moved by Councillor Madigan, second by Councillor Berman. Are there any further questions or comments with respect to the staff report PRC 2019-20? Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, there are, there's a number of, in, in my view, improvements uh, on this um, uh, granting uh, mechanism in that uh, it's, it's much uh, tighter in terms of criteria for application, criteria for performance indicators, etc. I'm also very pleased to see that um, there are uh, larger dollars, um, larger minimum grants uh, that would be uh, provided as opposed to um, a, an amount of money that really is insignificant. So those are those are a number of, of um, um, reasons why I would support this. Um, however, um, I think that the the comments and questions that have been raised by the arts community are are valid. And I'm not um, sure whether we could not uh, proceed to approve the new framework, framework for 2020, but at the same time undertake consultations with the arts community, because these may lead to actually much larger questions, uh, and come back with perhaps a different framework, uh, or even a different fund. Uh, for 2021. That would be my thought. Right. Well, I, I think we can uh, re-examine the policy once uh, once a year uh, without a reconsideration. But uh, I guess for pushing the barometer forward, there is delays in the sense that we're going to we're going to be approving a budget moving forward. We want to have that uh, framework in place. Uh, there are larger discussions to be had in the context of the use of the or investment of the sale proceeds and so there are legacy funds and legacy projects that are in the works uh, which all may uh, affect the, the landscape moving forward. Um, so I take your comments and I think for the purposes of today uh, we have this policy on the table before us and um, we need to call a vote on that unless there's other questions or comments. Councillor Hamlin. I'll be voting against this. Um, I appreciate the comments uh, that Councillor Doherty's made, and I do agree that this policy is better in most ways than the previous policy. Um, I am concerned as a community that we don't, uh, we haven't given enough recognition to arts and culture community. Um, 
it was interesting to hear of this, I'll say, small amount that's going to grow to grants. Um, less than half of it's going to the arts and culture community. And it's well recognized, you know, across our country that the arts and culture community contribute. They're usually at least 3% of the workforce. Um, they usually contribute, and they sure do in our community, substantially to the reason tourists come to town. We have a number of arts festivals. We have a number of people who come to town just to go to um, the artists and the artists, various artist studios and all the different art events that are taking place. So I think this is a good start, and I don't think it's enough, and I won't be voting in favor of it. Thank you. I guess one comment I would make before I call the vote is that this is the nature of a beast when you are dealing with grant programs, and the Parks and Recreation and Culture live a very broad portfolio. So it includes parks, which is recreation. It includes culture, which is culture. And last year we heard that culture received 12 of 25 grants. And it also supports very much needed social uh, initiatives in our community uh, from breaking down barriers and others. So it's always a very difficult task to be uh, handing out money to very uh, many worthy um, uh, causes. And uh, I, I, I'm not going to get into the discussion. I think that... Uh, we do support arts and culture in Collingwood. We are a partner at the Simcoe Street Theatre. Uh, items will be coming up on the uh, budget process, talking about that initiative moving forward. We will be looking at uh, implementing potentially a feasibility study for a future of arts. There is no doubt that we all work together in this community um, and across all sectors to improve our community and there's always room for improvement. I'm not sure that when we're looking at divvying up a pie of $50,000, there's any magic bullet. So, with that being said, I'm going to call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Two and a. And that is carried. Which brings us to item 12, Strategic Initiative Standing Committee, December 5, 2019. Your Deputy Mayor. We're, uh, we're, not, we're not done yet. Sorry. We're not done? Oh, sorry. 11 7, Deputy Mayor. I think you'll want to step out. We're, we're not there yet, sir. Yeah. Yeah, we got one. Well, I, I, I've got I've got a bylaw to provide the interim tax levy. I've got operation. Wait a sec. We got we got to get through this first. We'll do the bylaws in due course. Okay. Conflict. So he'll be stepping out for eleven point one point seven item eight point two. But we'll take it off the vote and call the vote. So we're looking for. That was approved. Okay. So we're just dealing with the. Uh, dealt with the climate emergency and we're now into the Collingwood funding support request. Yes, okay then. So we're dealing with 11.1.7 item 8.2. And Deputy Mayor, if you want to step out. Uh, Councillor Madigan. I apologize, Mayor Saunders, and I was just following the page down, so I didn't mean to jump ahead. I have that on my page. It looks like we're jumping ahead now, but we're back on track. So thank you. Moved by me, seconded by Councillor Berman. Be it resolved that General Consent Agenda 8.2, T. Hammond Collingwood Collegiate Hockey Course Instructor requests for funding regarding Hockey Day in Collingwood, January 15, 2020, from the Development Operations Services Standing Committee meeting held December 2nd, 2019, be received, and that the request for in-kind support to cover the cost of ICE rentals for the Hockey Day in Collingwood event scheduled for January 15th, 2020, be approved. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Community Services uh, Committee, so. Okay. Not to be fussy, but. We'll fix that. Councilor Hamm. Uh, I was just wondering what the amount of the grant would be. It's an in-kind uh, grant, but uh, Director Culver, what's the in-kind amount? Thank you, Worship. Uh, after Council McLeod had asked us the last meeting, I'm sorry that I didn't get back to Council, but it was, it's approximately $2,100 is the value of the in kind. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't hear that. $2,100. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, I think that was carried unanimously. And the Deputy Mayor is allowed back in. All right, so that wraps up 11. Now we're into 12, and the bylaws will be dealt with later. So we have the strategic initiative standing committee meeting of December 5, 2019. Deputy Mayor. 
Uh, thank you. This is moved by me and seconded by Councilor Doherty. Be it resolved that Council receive the Strategic Initiative Standing Committee report from its meeting held December 5th, 2019, and hereby approve the recommendations contained within the report as presented. 12.1.1, deputation request for assistance, RE feasibility study for proposed arts and culture and entertainment center. And 12.1.2 was the 2020 budget introduction, overview, and departmental budget review. Thank you. Council, does anyone want to pull anything before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried unanimously. Strategic Initiative Standing Committee meeting of December 9, 2019, 13.1, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, moved by me and seconded by Councillor Doherty, be it resolved that the Council receive the Strategic Initiative Standing Committee report from its meeting held December the 9th, 2019, and hereby approve the recommendations contained within the report as presented. Four, 13.1.1, proposed water and wastewater rates presentation by Hemson Consultant Limited. 13.1.2 is the compensation review presentation by Jeannie Mazansky of Gallagher. 13.1.3 was the asset management plan update presentation by Dennis Sloan uh, from our own department of manager budget manager of the budgets and financial planning. And 13.1.4 was staff report CC 2019-03 leasing. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any items to be pulled before I call the vote, Council? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried unanimously. And that carries us down to Development and Operations Services Standing Committee meeting of December 9, 2019, 14.1. Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Moved by me and seconded by Deputy Mayor Hall, be it resolved that Council receive the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee report from its meeting held December 9, 2019, and hereby approve the recommendations contained within the report. As presented, and there are five, 14.1.1, P2019-53, designation bylaw, 400 Maple Street, town file number R01BN118, uh, item 14.1.2, P2019-54, authorization to discharge a site plan control agreement, the Jasper Group office building at 201 Raglan Street, 14.1.3, C2019-10, Declare land as surplus, sale of lane 27 Simcoe Street, 14.1.4, the general consent agenda, which had one item, 8.1.1, the Ontario Building Officials Association, transforming and modernizing the delivery of Ontario's building code services, the OBOA solution, and finally 14.1.5, heritage preservation and maintenance agreements for 19 here Ontario Street, 265 Pine Street, 313 here Ontario Street, and 315 here on Ontario Street in Collingwood. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Council, any items to be pulled before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried unanimously. And that takes us down to staff reports, 15.1 C20-19-11 Lobbyist Registry Program, and that will be postponed to our first meeting of the new year, January 20. Item 16, Motions, AMO Waste Management Task Force, Council Representative. Who would have that? Uh, the motion? Yes. Um, uh, I would like to declare a uh, conflict uh, in that uh, this would be uh, an appointment affecting myself personally. However, I am now answer any questions before the Certainly. So what I would propose we do is table the motion, you can explain the circumstances, and then recuse yourself. Thank you. Uh, so first, uh, Mayor Saunderson, I have uh, the waiving of the requirements of the procedure bylaw for notice. Yes. Time is of the essence. So this is first. Moved by me, seconded by Councillor Madigan, be it resolved. The Council waived the requirements of the procedural bylaw to introduce a motion without the required notice for the consideration of the appointment to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, Waste Management Task Force. Do you want to speak briefly to the, uh, the urgency or the reason for waiving notice? Go ahead, Councillor Doherty. Uh, yes, um, the uh, first meeting of this newly formed task force will be early in the new year and they have um, AMO has requested confirmation of any member um, invitation before the end of 2019. Uh, maybe just to preempt, 
this scenario because I think once you leave the room, you're not going to come back in. But uh, have you been selected and approached by AMO to serve on this committee? Yes, that is correct. And so then we're waiting notice in order to get your appointment finalized before the first meeting in year end. And uh, well, that said, unless there's any other questions, Councilor, then I'm Councilor Majority. I think you're, you're good to go. Council. So the motion on the table is to waive the requirements of the procedural bylaw so that we can vote on this notice of motion tonight. All in favor? That is carried unanimously. Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Moved by me and seconded by Councillor Berman. Be it resolved that Council support the appointment of Councillor Deb Doherty to act as a representative on the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, Wet Waste Management Task Force, and that $2,000 be allocated annually to cover such expenses and professional development associated with fulfilling the responsibilities of this task force. I, I um, am very supportive of this appointment. I think it's very deserving, and I think it's a great opportunity for the town of Collingwood to have representation at AMO. Questions or comments, Council, before I call Council McLeod? Um, thank you. Through you, uh, Your Worship, to the Treasurer, where uh, would this money come from? Marjorie? Through you, Your Worship, the dollar amount is not overly significant, and I do believe that somewhere in the administration budget we could find uh, the funds to help out Councillor Murray through the year. My understanding is this is, an up, this is an upset limit to cover travel costs to be made in Toronto. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before I call the vote? All right. All in favor? That is carried unanimously. Can someone please escort in our new AMO waste management consultant? <laughs> Congratulations, Councillor Doherty. You are our waste management task force representative. And you will do us proud. Thank you. 17, bylaws. Councilor Madigan, do you have those by chance? Yeah, I do, thank you. Uh, moved by me, seconded by Councilor Berman, be it resolved that bylaw number 2019-081 being a bylaw to provide for the 2020 interim tax levy be enacted and passed this 16th day of December 2019. Staff report uh, T2019-18. Council, any comments or questions before we call the vote? Being done, all in favor? That is carried unanimously. Councillor Madigan. Thank you, sir. Moved by me, seconded by Councillor Bourbon. Be it resolved that bylaw number 2019-082 being a bylaw to authorize temporary borrowing to meet the current expenditures of the Town of Collingwood until taxes are collected and other revenues are received be enacted and passed the 16th day of December 2019 in regards to staff report T2019-9. Council, any comments or questions before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried unanimously. Councillor Madigan? So. Okay, so I'm looking to Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Mr. Saunderson. Moved by me and seconded by Councillor Doherty. Be it resolved that bylaw number 2019-083. Being a bylaw to designate a property to be of cultural heritage value or interest under Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act be enacted and passed the 16th day of December 2019, referring to staff report T2019-53. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments, Council? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? That is carried unanimously. And 17.4, Councillor Jeffrey. I have that. Maddie, what's going on? <laughs> Ping pong. We're just throwing you off tonight. We are. Yeah, moved by B, seconded by Councillor Berman, be it resolved that bylaw number 2019-084 being a bylaw to delegate authority to the Treasurer to authorize the execution of tax arrears extension agreements be enacted and passed the 16th day of December 2019 in regards to staff report T2019-04. Thank you. Any questions or comments before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in, uh, all in favor? Opposed? Moving on. That 
brings us down to notices of motion. Any notices of motion tonight? County report, I think given the hour, Deputy Mayor, we can put that over. You look hard broken. I will say one, if I may, yes, in, in the spirit of waste management, if we can't find the 2,000 at home, by the way, we have to ask the county to just <laughs> see if we um, But we've had lots of notice go out that February 3rd is the day that we are switching to yes. for uh, waste removal, and uh, there'll be further announcements in the new year. Yeah, exactly. Further announcements will leave no recycling bin unturned. Uh, yeah, older deferred business. Any older deferred business around the table? Seeing none, any other business? Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I know you say because of the hour, but if we don't do these things when they're current, I, I fear that by the time I get to the end of January, it's really not of interest anymore. And uh, some of the snippets of the Joint Police Services Board has already been reported through through the media, but I think it's important to keep Council up to date on, on those meetings. So. Um, the reason for the meeting of the Joint Police Services Board uh, boards between Town of Collingwood and Town of the Blue Mountains, uh, number one, it had been some time since uh, we had met jointly, I think it was in 2017, and we are in the unique position of being one police service with two police services boards making up a large area served. So we explored uh, areas of commonality and uh, to identify joint strategic initiatives. Um, the other reason was to receive and discuss an update of regional analytical information, uh, law enforcement specific to uh, collisions. The new business we covered was uh, with respect to provincial appointee status update. Town of Blue Mountains has received confirmation of their provincial appointee in Collingwood. Um, we still await um, ours and I'm hopeful that it should be soon. And the provincial appointments are taking a significant amount of time for both of the police services boards. Um, we addressed community safety and well-being report that uh, will be due at the end of uh, next year. There will be individual community plans um, uh, appearing as schedules under one regional plan. And the town of Collingwood is in a grouping with Clearview Township, Springwater Township, and Wasaga Beach under the Simcoe County plan led by a consultant. Uh, town of Blue Mountains, while sharing many health services from Collingwood and Simcoe County, are included under the regional plan of Gray County. So the Town of Blue Mountains feels that it's uh, still very important for them to be included in Collingwood sessions for information purposes to, to inform their individual community plan and vice versa. So Inspector Shannon responded to the question regarding who the plans were to be implemented by. Was it enforcement police driven or multi-agency driven? And the province is the driver of this requirement. And um, with the intention to create a model where the community of services identified for the community safety and well-being plans will share responsibilities and provide a better roadmap for our residents and visitors' safety and uh, well-being. Uh, so individual community plans are due December 1st, 2020, and it would be imperative for us to track the regional work and be able to work the local plans concurrently to ensure a timely completion. And Executive Director Sonia Skinner is the senior staff member responsible for this file and is the staff member supporter for calling the Police Services Board. With respect to the collisions, we had a very interesting uh, three-year regional analytical report where Inspector Shannon presented uh, three years of data for motor, motor vehicle collisions occurring uh, in both in the town of Collingwood and town of Blue Mountains, including heat maps which highlighted location and frequency. And the inspector also shared the information with the view to examining more suitable solutions to current traffic patterns. And we'll be bringing a recommendation to the Collingwood Police Services Board uh, regarding reverse angle parking for the town of Collingwood uh, to prevent the backing out of vehicles on here Ontario Street. Uh, something we have visited before, but the statistics are showing maybe we should be revisiting. Uh, under other business, the Joint Boards also received a report from the OPP staff on the Marine Unit statistical data for 2019. Uh, the Collingwood Police Services Board was able to confirm that it is the OPP's intention to train jointly with Collingwood's Fire Department on their marine vessel if approved in Collingwood's current budget. It is also their intention to create a protocol and similar to mutual aid agreements currently used for fire department resources, an agreement to best serve the water traveling public. It was emphasized that it is more important to get help to the scene on the water even if it means having both OPP and fire vessels showing up. Of emerging significance was the um, Town of Blue Mountains um, 
Public Police Services Board approval to serve as a host for a grant application request to address child advocacy in the region. And the uh, Collingwood Police Services Board provided a motion of support for the grant application. Then uh, lastly, the members had a brief discussion on potential opportunities and challenges with respect to the, uh, with both PSBs and agreed to meet at least once uh, jointly annually, preferably in January and uh, to which the Collingwood Police Services Board members offered to host the meeting in January 2021. And there's always the opportunity to join you if required at the call of the chairs uh, in any case. And that is my report from that meeting. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. I have some report, and I guess the, uh, one thing that struck me during the course of the meeting with the, uh, the detail of the data they had about the accidents and the, um, the engagement of the police in, in our traffic calming study, I know they're anxious to meet with Public Works to, uh, to look at helping us in, in that project moving forward. So that's, that's a, a great collaboration. Any other business? Councillor Hammond. Uh, I was just wondering if I could ask a question of Councillor Jeffrey uh, rising out of her report. Certainly, go ahead. Um, so, I, you mentioned that there will, the uh, police services will be bringing to the board um, the stats on the areas where there's high accident rates. And I was wondering if you might be able to share that with council. Um, I, I was also thinking about our traffic calming study coming forward and there may be ways that our own staff and ourselves could contribute to improving those areas uh, where we're seeing high accident rates. I think it's, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to circulate that. There was very specific parameters that they searched under and it was very helpful. And I think going forward, we will need to help support our police services um, to uh, to put a dent and uh, try to reduce some of the uh, collisions and things that are going on. Okay. I don't know, putting a dent in collisions is a good <laughs> yes. I take the point. Yeah. All right, any other business? Oh, I was just going to do FCM. Oh, okay, go ahead, Councillor Jeffrey. Right. Uh, I just wanted to share some key points from the FCM's uh, advocacy days in um, Ottawa on November 26 to 29. As you know, we unite as 2,000 municipalities um, represented by 75 board members and um, we represent 90% of all Canadians. So we use this moment to launch Building Better Lives together and I forward it to council members. I hope you take the opportunity to read it closely. It does present recommendations to work with uh, municipalities in 15 priority areas from getting infrastructure built to making housing more affordable and to championing uh, rural communities. And I have um, touched base with our MP and I hope to uh, meet with him before uh, he returns to uh, Parliament uh, probably hopefully before mid-January. So this meeting featured FCM's annual advocacy event, which was different because Parliament wasn't sitting. So we had um, the marshal of our full board to influence federal decision makers, but our meetings included 11 cabinet ministers and the prime minister. And um, national pundits uh, shared insights on the political environment, and FCM staff presented new tools to take our first 100 days message to MPs in our own writings. So we left the meeting ready to seize uh, the opportunity of this minority parliament. It is surely an opportunity for FCM in its advocacy work. Um, Canadians are looking for concrete results and our message to every federal party is clear. If you want to build better lives, you need to work with the government's closest to people's lives. Um, I know that our CAO did notice that FCM had developed a Western Economic Solutions Task Force and it met for the first time in Ottawa during those meetings. The acronym is WEST, and its mandate is centered on finding solutions for struggling Western communities, and they'll be raising uh, the voice of those communities directly to the federal government. I knew they, I know they did the same time because I chaired a joint economic development working group when Ontario was at the peak of its uh, problems in terms of manufacturing job losses. Uh, FCM's Governance Review Task Force, of which I have uh, one of five appointees across Canada, presented preliminary recommendations for discussion, and the board's objective is to ensure that FCM's governance model is equipped to support members' needs and the ambitions of our new five-year strategic plan. So the task force will examine the day's feedback and continue the consultation at our March 2020 board meeting. And on a sadder note, our CEO, Brad Carlton, announced that he will retire. He will not be renewing his contract as at July 31st, 2020. And uh, through his leadership in 12 years, uh, Brock has presided over a period of unprecedented growth 
in FCM's membership, program delivery, federal influence, and concrete achievements. The search for FCM's next CEO begins immediately. And that's the highlights. Thank you, Councilor Jeffrey. You, uh, you do us proud when you represent us at FCM. Who has a confirmatory bylaw? I have that, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Hardy. Uh, moved by me and seconded by Deputy Mayor Hull. Be it resolved that bylaw number 2019-085 being the bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular meeting of council held December 16th, 2019, be enacted and passed the 16th day of December 2019. Thank you. I'll call the vote. All in favor? That is passed unanimously, and we need a motion to adjourn, Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you very much. That was a productive meeting. We have an SIC meeting for the budget, so I'm going to give Council a 10-minute bio break, so that means we're back here at uh, 8 minutes to 7.